He's not a guest. He is a friend. Hallelujah. Uh, I am so glad to see him. He is literally, um, he, he is the joy of Erie, Pennsylvania, and has been. How many years? 20, 21 years here. He ministered for Erie first, and he come back, and he's with us this morning. So, I, I, I'm excited. I'm blessed. He, um, our friendship has always been. That's why he still returns. And uh, I just want us to give him a warm welcome. If you would stand to your feet and just honor Pastor Jack Reisner. Please sit down. It is so good to be here. You ever been away from home and you come in and you, you just come in and you just breathe deep and sigh and you get to that chair you always sit in and you, and you, you kick back in and you kick your shoes off and take your socks off and I'm not taking my socks off but this feels really good today. Feels good to be home, and it's nice to be with Apostle Kevin and Denise. They're just, they're our family, and um, they're just, you know, what you see on Sunday morning is the way they always are. And uh, in fact, we were, uh, Pam, and Pam sends her greetings. She is, uh, would wish to be here, but she is at home today making biscuits and gravy for the grand boys. So <clears throat> they hold priority, sorry. But Pam and I were, had to be back in town about three or four weeks ago and had dinner with Apostle Kevin and Denise, and we walked out of the restaurant, and standing there, we just said, we have this issue that we're dealing with in our family and want to make you aware of it, and just standing there on the sidewalk, uh, they prayed over us and then began to give us prophetic words, and you know, the stuff that you hear on Sunday morning is their life. And so... Um, God has honored you by placing them here to guide you. And don't ever take that for granted. Please don't. So I ask you a question this morning. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Marvin Gaye did ask that. You're right. That, that is a weird question to ask because I, I have a friend who... Um, when I first came to Erie, Pennsylvania, and I met him, his, his, most people say, how you doing, you know? And, and you, can, you can respond by just saying, fine, you know? But, but he said, how's it going? And then he said, what's going on? What's going on? And I thought, well, what's going on with what? What's going on with, with home? What's going on with my education? What's going on with my haircut? What's going on with, <laughs> with my acid reflux? What's, what's going on? <clears throat> So his, his question stumped me, and, and I began to think about that as, as, as I be here with you today, and when I ask you what's going on, part of the issue is I'm not even sure we know what's going on. So I was on a flight about three months ago going from Springfield, Missouri to Chicago, and we had gotten about as far as St. Louis, and the pilot came on and he said... Uh, folks, we've been diverted to St. Louis. We're going to, man we're going to land immediately. Please buckle your seatbelts, put your trays up, get ready. We're, we're going to land immediately. And, and they weren't kidding. I mean, we, we waited for no one. We landed on the runway, and then they did not go to the gate. They went to the exterior of the airport. And waiting for us were a fleet of fire trucks. And a guy got out of the fire truck, in, one of the fire trucks, and he walked around the plane with some kind of meter. He was registering something. And finally, evidently, he gave the go-ahead, and then we pulled into the gate, and I stood up, and I was close enough to the front. I heard the flight attendant open up the cockpit door, and she said, are you guys all right? Could you see? And she turned, I said, what's going on? And she said, did you smell smoke out here? I said, no. She said, well, that cockpit door sealed it pretty good. She said, the cockpit filled with smoke. So if you would have asked me when I got ready to leave Springfield, what's going on, I would have said, well, I'm going to Shrewsbury, Pennsylvania to speak. If you'd asked me in St. Louis, I'd have told you, I have no idea what's going on. 
I want to show you a picture, of course you've got it, of Bob Goff. Can you throw that up there? That's Bob Goff. If you'd asked Bob Goff what's going on, he would have said 25 years of a successful law firm. Except then Bob Goff, who's a believer in Jesus, a follower, ended up in Uganda with some friends, and, and there in Uganda, he discovered that this, there is this, this common practice with the healers, or what we would call witch doctors, which is to abduct boys, mutilate them, and leave them for dead, because it's part of their religious rituals, part of their sacrifice. It's supposed to bring them luck. And nobody's had the courage to ever confront the witch doctors, because they're powerful. Well, for somehow, God arranged it that, that one of those children, one of them that actually lived through the ordeal, met Bob Goff, and Bob Goff was horrified, and something in his spirit said, this is not right. And so Bob Goff became the first person in Ugandan history to bring a witch doctor to trial for attempted murder. And he won. The guilty verdict set a precedent in Ugandan courts that gave them now the ability to go after justice and make change in that culture. Rescuing children was not part of Bob's plan, but it was part of God's plan. And that's what was going on. In fact, he didn't realize this was going to happen, but the United States has now named him as a diplomat to Uganda, and he is the honorary consul for the Republic of Uganda. So he gave up his successful law firm. He talks about this, he writes about this, and he rescues children, and he fights against trafficking. He didn't expect it. But when he saw the opportunity, he walked into it. I want to propose to you today that much of life is not planning and doing, but seeing and responding. No matter how holy and sincere we are, because we are human, there are those moments that our plans get in the way of God's plans, and we need to be aware of what's happening around us. And so as I was preparing this, I said, God, what is the word today? What is the word for Abundant Life Church? And I felt like God was saying that what you have done and that the home house and all you have worked through and really labored to come about is only the first step. That there is something far beyond what you have done thus far, and you need to be looking for it, and when it comes, you'll need to walk through that open portal. Bob, used, Bob says this, I used to be afraid of failing at something that really mattered to me, but now I'm more afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. And then he says this, we don't need a plan, we just need to be present. God, open my eyes to see what's really going on around me. So being a perfectionist, that freaks me out to ever think about not having a plan. When I leave on a trip, I know everything about my trip. I know where I'm going. I know where the lounge is at the airport. I know <laughs> where I'm headed next. I know where the restaurants are. I've got it all figured out. And so what I'm, not, I'm not saying to you don't have a plan. What I'm saying to us this morning is our plans must always be subservient to the plans of God. So how do we plan so we can see what we haven't planned? Well, check out how the Apostle Paul did this. Writing to the church in Corinth, he says this in 1 Corinthians 16. I'm coming to visit you after I have been to Macedonia, for I'm planning to travel through Macedonia. And perhaps... I will stay a while with you, possibly all winter. And then you can send me on my way to my next destination. And this time, I don't want to make it just a short visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while, if the Lord will let me. In the meantime, I'll be staying here at Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost, because there is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. If ever there was an uncertain plan, that was it. And what exactly happened was that he got so wrapped up in the open door that was in front of him that he had to revise that plan twice, and the time when he did come, it was for a shorter amount of time. Even Paul the Apostle, this one who had been to heaven and back, even Paul had to revise his date book and his location. 
because of what was presently in front of him. So how do we plan for what's going on? Most of us know this bit of wisdom, and it's, it's ageless, written by the man of wisdom, Solomon, when he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding in all your ways. In all your ways, what? Knowledge him and he will direct your path. Or he will show you which path to take. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That word heart actually deals with the intellect, the emotions, and our decision making. He said, I want you to take those parts of your life and I want you then to regulate them through the filter of God. So that when your emotions begin to take over in your life and, and you see an open place to go and you fear it and you're anxious about it or your feeling inside says, I don't want to be with those people, I don't like those people, those people were mean to me, I'm not sure I want to go to that place and you have this anxiety. Paul said to the church in Philippians, he said, be anxious for nothing but with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving make your request known to God and the peace of God will garrison, will guard your heart and your emotions, will guard your mind and your emotions. So when you are seeing this open door in front of you and you're not sure you feel great about going and the emotions begin to ride on you at that moment, you've got to say, but God, I'm taking my emotions and running them through you. I'm praying this through until I have peace. It's that moment that you feel like God's telling you to now enlarge your territory and move beyond where you've been and intellectually you can't understand how that could ever happen. But at that moment, you've got to bring it to God and God will say, yeah, but I can do this. You've got to take your decision-making process that says, I'd rather go over here. Father, I would rather, I would rather pastor in Honolulu <laughs> than in Erie, Pennsylvania. In January. But God says, but I've got a path for you. So first you regulate the heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. That means now I have to relinquish my former way. See, God, I've done it this way all the time. This is how I, how I move in life. This is the path that I've walked. This is the way that I've gone. These are the, these are the routines that I have I've put together, and you were there when those were created, and therefore, they've got to be right. And God says, no, it is time to let those go. See, what I'm telling you is what has happened at the home house is a wonderful thing, but sometime in the, in the future, God's going to say, but I'm shifting things now. I'm changing things, and you've got to let them go. Your tradition has got to change. Because the time has changed. Pastor Kevin, you've been talking about that just before I came up here. That there's a shift. There's something happening. And when the shift happens, you've got to let go because if you hold on to the past, you can never move to the future. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. and all your paths, acknowledge him. And he will direct them. Then we have to reposition ourselves. So we're on this path, you're walking this path, and you feel like you're where you're supposed to be. And as you're walking it, and you think that this is the deal you're going towards, but suddenly there is God standing on your path, and he said, I want you to come this way. Now you've got to reposition yourself to move that direction and move past your fear and move past your intellectual ob objections. You move that direction. You have to reposition. And then sometimes God says, the path you're on, I'm no longer there. I'm over on this path. So now you've got to reposition yourself over to a new path. And he says, if you do that, I'll direct you, which really literally means this, that he will make your path smooth. He will make it straight. He will make it he will make it prosperous that you will achieve what he wants you on that path and he will give you pleasure in the process. How does he make it pleasurable? Someone once said the two greatest days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. <laughs> because knowing why opens our eyes to the present opportunities. Why tells us why we are doing what we are doing. We just don't do and say, we'll figure out why. We've got to know why. We in the church have, in the last couple of decades, have been stuck on how. What's your spiritual gifting? So that's my spiritual gifting. What's your spiritual gifting? 
Now we're doing Enneagrams. This is me. I'm a number three with a wing to the seven or whatever. It just, or, or the disc profile. I, I'm, I'm a D and I'm an I and with a, with a C influence. And who cares? <laughs> really, that's important, but that's the how. So if, if Pam and I, if, 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 if we were, if our why was to build a pizza, I can tell you right now that we would build a pizza, but we'd both build it different. I'd pull out the pizza pan and I would get all the ingredients. I'd line them up. I would have the recipe in front of me. I would have it perfectly in place and everything in place before I even got started. And then I would slowly layer them on and put them in the places they need to be. And then I'd put them in the oven at the exact time whenever after it's been preheated because you don't put it in before it's preheated. You can mess that up. So you preheat, you put it in. I got it in there. And then, then I clean everything up so that when it comes out, it's ready to go and the plates are ready and the dishes are on there. It's all set to go. When Pam makes a pizza, the refrigerator refrigerator door opens up and she starts going, let's try this and this and this and this. I said, what are you doing? What's the recipe? I don't need no recipe. Boom. (laughs) See, that's the how. But the pizza gets made. So what's your why? Watch Jesus declare his why. He's beginning his ministry And he declares this, and Luke records it in Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Here's my anointing. Because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus knows his why. And he says, I got really good news for you. The world is broken, and I'm here to fix it. I've got good news for you, and that good news is more than just forgiveness of sins. And for a long, for a long time, the church just focused on, let's get people saved, and we're fine. And it's important that people find a relationship with Jesus and find that forgiveness. But Jesus is saying, but he's also called me to take what's happening in heaven and put it down here on my path. He said, my why is to bring the favor of God back to this earth. To bring the compassion and the forgiveness and the blessings of God on this earth, on my path right now. And knowing my why, he says, now I know what to do. And what I will do is this, confront oppression and prejudice and religious elitism and hatred. And I'll be kind to my enemies. I will feed the hungry, heal the sick, and become a friend of sinners, beggars, and outcasts. And what Jesus is doing is turning his followers' hearts to the hungry and hurting so that he can turn the hearts of the hungry and hurting to the favor of God. So Bob knows his why. His why is to show God's compassion, his favor to Michael, and he rescues Michael. But then Bob also knows that his his why is that he needs to bring favor to the witch doctors. So he goes and meets with them and wants to understand what motivates them to do what they have done, this horrendous act. And as he talks to them, they begin to uncover what they really want is to be educated. So Bob and his friends get a mobile van and they go out in November 2014 to Gulu, Uganda, and they begin to teach them. And Bob understands that a person cannot be totally transformed until they have had an encounter with the compassion of Jesus. So Bob loves the witch doctor in ways that messes with people's minds. So he stands in a room of graduates, and he walks up to each graduate, a witch doctor, takes him first by the hand and shakes his hand, then takes the face of the witch doctor in his hands and cradles it. And then he kisses them on the forehead. And then he says this. There will be severe ramifications if you choose to hurt any more children. And what you have there is the incredible compassion of God coming forth with justice. See, our path is more present than planned. It has less to do with location, occupation, and education, and a lot more to do with compassion. Look around you in the life you live right now, where he's placed you, whether it's the campus or, or where you work, where you recreate, wherever you are. On that path, God is going to open up 
a portal, a place of compassion, a place where the status quo is not acceptable, where a flood of love and kindness needs to be released. Know your why, because when you know the why, you'll see the opportunities. That is why Paul said, there is a wide open door for a great work here. That wide open means, it comes from the word megas. There is a mega, large, loud portal. It's an opportunity in front of you. And you see it now because you know your why. Your why is not to get promoted at work. Your why is not to find a husband or a wife. I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> your why is not to really hurry and get your kids out of the house. Your why is where is that compassion, where is that favor of God needed? Whether it's justice or resisting oppression or, or praying for an enemy where is that portal? And as you see it and you walk into it with kindness and love, you will begin to recognize that perhaps you had more kindness than you thought you had because as that portal opens up, you begin to give out more than you thought you have and go deeper than you thought you could. But there will be adversaries, Paul said. They will be against me. Even yourself will be against you doing this because compassion is not easy. So how do you do that? How do you move into what's going on, what God is doing around you? I'd like to recommend, first of all, that you do the next kind thing God puts in front of you. It's, it's not going to be a thunderbolt. He's not going to wake in the middle of the night and say, go start a house for whatever. It's going to begin opening up as you begin to be kind the next thing in front of you. Hal Donaldson became a successful journalist and writer and he lived a life of poverty. And now he was happy he was out of that and, and he didn't want to deal anymore. In fact, in his writing, they wanted to send him to where tragedy was and he wouldn't do it because he lived enough of it when he was a kid. So he was just happy becoming a very successful sports writer. He had an opportunity to go write a book with Mark and Hulda Buntain who were in Calcutta, India, dealing with the severe, severe issues that Calcutta faced and the, and the pain and the suffering and the hunger and the death. When he got there, the Buntain surprised him. They said, hey, we've got, a, we've got an interview set up for you with Mother Teresa. So he went and spent time with Mother Teresa. As their time came to an end, she said to him, Hal, what are you doing for the poor and suffering? Now, Hal said, I knew I couldn't lie to Mother Teresa. So I said, nothing. And she said, Hal, everybody can do something. What's the next kind of thing you can do that God puts in front of you? You see, you walk, you walk the path with Jesus long enough, your mission will find you. He will lead you right up to it and you will see a wide open door and you may even say, but how? How can I do this? Well, you just start where you are. But you're aware of it because it's your why. So Hal came back from Calcutta, grabbed his brothers, loaded up his pickup truck with food and a trailer with food and went out to the migrant workers in Northern California and began to feed them. And Hal will tell you that as he did the next kind thing God put in front of him, there was another thing that God put in front of him and another thing God put in front of him, and soon he began to see his path. Do the next kind thing God puts in front of you and then find your path. Look for it. So Hal asked Mark Buntain, if you ever got tired of the massive task of all the suffering and the pain and the dying, and do you ever get tired of the stench? Do you, how do you deal with this? Mark said, no, I don't get tired of this because they're our mission. They're why we are here. This isn't sacrifice, this is privilege. They told Hal, they said, this is not some spontaneous, sporadic, one-time event and then everybody's happy that somebody was kind. He said that 
This was our path. This is, this is, this is our lifestyle. So, Hal began feeding migrant workers in 1994. Because, you see, they challenged him to find kindness as a lifestyle. Otherwise, he said, you won't see other people's needs as opportunities to do something. So he kept his job, as, his day job as a writer, and he kept finding this need and then this need and this need, and the, and the path began to open up, and soon he, he understood his why. He realized this was what he was supposed to be doing, and, and he named that thing that he was doing that path Convoy of Hope. And we're not different than Hal. You may say, yeah, but, but I'm having a tough time. I don't have a lot. God knows that. But I've read the scriptures and I don't find any place that God said the only people who can be kind are the people who make over 100000 a year. He said, I'm going to call on you to be kind and you can find ways to do that because it'll lead you to your path. It will become your lifestyle. So Hal's path led him to 25 years of feeding the hungry and helping the hurting. And back then he had no idea that his path would even accomplish this last year. Check this out. So you do the next kind thing that God puts in front of you. Then you begin to see a path that becomes your lifestyle. And thirdly, I invite you to, for you to invite radicals to join you. When Jesus invited Peter, James, and John to go walk with him, come follow me, he was inviting them to let go of their comfort, let go of what was familiar to move into a revolutionary path. It is radical to follow Jesus in his why. 
Hal Donaldson writes this, he says, until you have a team with committed revolutionaries, you're limited to what you alone can accomplish. And if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. You see, friends, there, there, are, there are cultural issues. There are, there are causes. There are, there, are, there are situations that can only be achieved, that can only be confronted, that can only be challenged and changed by a mass of compassionate warriors. So Hal began to invite others to join him 25 years ago. And there's now such a huge army of people who say, we are here, we know what our why is. We're part of this army. So that in 25 years, 115 million people have been served. One billion dollars of product have been delivered to people who are in need. 200,404 children are being fed every week through their schools in 14 countries. Maria is one of them. I think we have a picture of Maria. Can we put that up there, Chris? No, okay, that's right. I met Maria in a Central American country. Maria lives in a country where men are valued highly and women are devalued. She's, she is in middle school. She would be in middle school, and she's... She understands the culture around her as one of violence and discrimination and the pressure to be involved sexually at a young age and get married at a young age. For the last year, Maria was part of a girls' empowerment program where she came in to discover the value that she had in Jesus, how God saw her. She was given basic education, and the way we got a hold of Maria is because, you see, because we offer feeding in schools, parents will now allow their kids to come to school because before that time, they would not go to school because they needed to be in the fields working with the parents so they could have enough to eat or at the garbage dumps trying to find some food or to, something to repurpose and sell. And so we began to, to feed in schools, and parents said, well, if, if you can go be fed there, go there. And the kids then, with nutritious meals, began to, to absorb their education with the hope that the education would bring them out of poverty. Maria was one of those. And so they began to train Maria in, in, in this girl's empowerment and began to teach her nutrition and began to teach her hygiene. No one told her about hygiene, about her emotional health and her spiritual health and how to, to make wise choices to counter the culture's negativity with the hopes that she would stay in school, that she would postpone getting married, that she would grab hold of the idea of a skill so that she, eventually she would get a job, that she'd understand who she is in Jesus. I have a... I have this, this picture in my mind of the graduation day for Maria. And she's standing there, and her mother is standing behind her because you see her mother is part of our women's empowerment because once we get, get to know the kids, we get to know their mothers, and we say the mothers need to know culturally what, who they are in Jesus. And so we begin to teach the mothers on, on who they are in Jesus and, and begin to give them uh, development of life skills and parenting skills and teaching them to develop occupational skills. And then we teach them how to start a business and then we give them what they need to start their business. And so Maria's mother standing behind her at this graduation and, and the picture I see is Maria sobbing. Not because she's sad, but because at that moment, her mother's standing behind her with a letter that she has written. And what she is reading to her daughter is something that she's never heard before. She's telling her who she is in Jesus and who she can become and the value that her mother finds in her and what her future can be because of Jesus Christ. And Maria begins to sob because it's like all of that ugliness and negativity is being rooted out by the truth of who Jesus is and what he wants for her. And it's coming up out of her and she begins to sob and later as we stand together after we have delivered purity rings to them because they said we won't be involved until it's time to be married. She said, would you please tell the people, all those people who made this possible, thank you because it's changed me, it's changed my family, it's changing our community. See, that's what an army of people can do. They have discovered, Maria and her mother, that, that there is a hope, and that hope has a name, and that name is Jesus. So what's going on? 
Well, for you, something that's going to be going on around just before Thanksgiving is you have an opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life with just one day. You're going to be challenged in these weeks to come to look at your work and say, what is, what is one day's labor? What, is it, what do I get? One day's wage. What is that? And on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, you're going to show up together as a mighty army, and each of you, by faith, are going to come with one day's wage and say, this is for somebody else. You're going to have a sticker that just says one day, and someone at work's going to say to you, why are you wearing that? And say, well, today I'm working for a girl named Maria in El Salvador. I'm working for a mom in the Philippines. I'm, I'm working to empower this lady in Ethiopia. Today, it's their day, and this is a sacred moment because I'm giving this to God and I'm giving it to them because you'll discover this, that your one day will change their every day. See, that's what happens when you know your why and you follow the path and you gather other around you, an army of compassionate warriors who are changing this world. Someone said, sociologists have said that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So choose wisely. And my encouragement is that you let it be with an army of radicals intent on being generous and kind and displaying the power of God. Let, Let it be your own convoy of hope. So what's going on? I want Hal to tell you one more time what's going on. You are entering a world that's in crisis. Desperation, fear, loneliness have reached epidemic proportions. And millions still don't know that Jesus will. Let's give God praise today. Many of you know in July, I took a trip down to El Salvador in support of Convoy of Hope. 